Hello and welcome to O-Worm. Today we'll be taking a look at the anatomy of a snake. This specific snake is a non-venomous garter snake. As you may already know, although snakes get a bit of a bad rep, they are incredibly important organisms in our ecosystem and they have a beautifully unique biology that's fascinating to learn about. So snakes are a group of limbless, elongated reptiles. To break down each of those words, limbless means that snakes do not have any limbs. So obviously, as you can see, snakes don't have arms or legs. Elongated just means that snakes have a very long body shape compared to its width. This very unique body shape gives snakes a lot of advantages, but also requires them to have a lot of adaptations to make up for both the lack of limbs and the little amount of space they have in their body. And lastly, reptiles are a much larger group of animals that are adapted for living and reproducing on land. While some species might spend time in water, most reptile species spend the majority of their time on land. Some other species of reptiles include turtles, lizards, crocodiles, and alligators. So now let's take a look at the external anatomy. The dorsal, or the backside of the snake, is facing us right now. So notice how the skin of the snake looks. The skin protects the snake's body, retains moisture, and provides camouflage. Snake skin feels cool and dry to the touch, and is made of multiple overlapping scales. These overlapping scales are made of keratin, which is the same protein that makes up our hair and nails. The overlapping nature of the scales gives the snakes a lot of flexibility while maintaining strength, kind of like chainmail in medieval armor. So the scales can slide past each other, but the individual scales themselves are very tough and durable. Snakes also shed their skin when they outgrow it multiple times a year. But what's actually somewhat unique among snakes is that they shed all of their skin in one piece, like peeling off a sock, while other reptiles usually shed their skin piece by piece. So now let's flip over the snake to look at the ventral, or belly side, of the snake. On the ventral side, the scales look kind of different. They are still overlapping, but they're longer and wider. This is because these scales are specialized to help the snake slither over the ground and to help the snake feel vibrations through the ground to sense its environment. But as you can see, these snakes on the ventral side are still overlapping. So now let's take a look at the head of the snake. Snakes don't have what we think of as eyelids, Instead, they have what's called a brilla, which is a kind of clear, immovable scale that you can see right here that covers each eye. Since they don't have eyelids, snakes can't blink. Here are the nostrils of the snake, here and here. While these nostrils are used to breathe, they're surprisingly not used to smell. Instead, snakes smell with their tongues. How does that work? Well, snakes flick their tongue out into the air, collecting particles. Then the snake brings the tongue back into its mouth, where specialized cells detect the quote-unquote smell of the particles. Here is the mouth of the snake. This garter snake doesn't have any fangs because it's a non-venomous snake. Fangs are specialized teeth that are hollow on the inside used to inject venom. So this garter snake, being a non-venomous snake, doesn't have or need any fangs. One thing to notice is that while snakes have two rows of teeth in the lower mouth, as you can see right here and here, they actually have four rows of teeth on the upper mouth. So as you can see, there's one, two, three, and four. Snake teeth also curve backwards, as you can see here, like a hook. So the reason for both of these facts 
is that snakes need to be able to pull their prey into their mouth without having arms that can help hold on to the prey and push it into their mouth. So the way they have to do this is they use their teeth to hook onto and shove the prey into their mouth. So each of these teeth are hooked backwards, as you can kind of see here. So once it hooks onto a prey, it doesn't easily let go. And as each tooth hooks onto the prey, including the four rows of teeth on the upper mouth, the prey gets successively pulled into the mouth of the snake. So now let's look at the snake's jaws. What's really interesting about the jaws of snakes, at least the lower jaw, is that it's actually made of two separate bones connected by a stretchy ligament. So as you can see, I can move each half of the jaw separately. If you feel your own jaw, you'll see that it's one solid piece of bone. In contrast, the snake's uniquely separated jaw allows it to open its mouth much wider to swallow prey that is many times larger than its head. And now the tongue of the snake is visible right here. It's actually much longer than it looks like, since much of the tongue is coiled up inside the snake's mouth when not in use. But this is just a little segment of the tongue that you can see peeking out right here. You can see the teeth a little better here, and like mentioned before, the teeth of the snake hook backwards. Now, if we follow the snake towards its tail end, right here, we can see the cloaca. So you can see the cloaca right here. And the cloaca is the exit for both the digestive and urogenital systems. Another thing to note is that past the cloaca in the tail region, the ventral scales become smaller. So the ventral scale before the cloaca right here is much larger than these. Thanks for watching. Click here for part 2 of the snake dissection, where we'll take a look at the internal anatomy.